Hello, and welcome to Quilt Achievius Markets and Cut podcast, your weekly insight into the topics and trends that we've been exploring here at Quilt Achievius. Please make sure to hit the follow button on your preferred streaming platform and tap on LinkedIn's hashtag QC weekly comment to keep up to date with our weekly insights. I'm your host, James Coker, an investment manager based out of our Birmingham office. This week, I'm pleased to be joined by Richard Carter, our head of fixed income research, and Will Howlett, our financials analyst. A very good morning to you both. Last week, investors had multiple data points from which to take the US economy's pulse. Labour market tightness, a key theme underpinning inflation's persistence, was reiterated. On Friday, non-farm payrolls, a survey of new jobs added, exceeded expectations by a factor of two times. Whilst a sign of rude economic health, the expectation for the Federal Reserve being able to soon cut rates has diminished. The report followed news last week that job openings jumped in August, and first-time applications for unemployment benefits remained low in September. Now, Richard, bond investors are facing their third consecutive year of losses. The pivot narrative seems to have well and truly given way to the higher for longer expectation for rates. Did this data point support a trend or has it prompted new questions? Indeed, was there a meaningful change to rate expectations? James, I think the um, the data we had last week on the jobs front uh, has, is a part of a trend that we've seen now for some time, and that's that the US economy, despite all the predictions of doom and gloom, uh, is very resilient. And uh, the sort of long talked about recession doesn't seem to be arriving. And uh, certainly the, the payroll number, you know, as you say, well above expectations. Um, yes, you know, wage growth is not as strong as it was, but there's absolutely no sign that the, all the rate hikes uh, the Federal Reserve has been doing over the last year or so have had much of an impact on uh, slowing the demand for labour, particularly in the service sector. So, so yes, bond yields, which have been rising steadily for, for a while now, uh, were up again. Um, although I have to say the uh, expectations for rate hikes from the Fed has not changed massively. It's still the action in bond markets really has been at the long end on this sort of higher for longer um, expectation. But, um, you know, we have uh, inflation numbers coming out in the States this week. Clearly, if they're bad, then the, um, you know, the talk of uh, a Fed rate hike in November will, will only increase. That's interesting. And um, a big part of this rise in the longer term, as you mentioned, has been estimated to be an increase in the term premium for bonds. Uh, does this and the higher, the longer consensus challenge the soft landing scenario that's been baked into some markets this year? Yeah, it does really. I mean, the, the, the term premium, the sort of extra compensation you get for buying uh, longer dated bonds versus sort of just sort of shorter dated where you just you know keep rolling them uh, forever. Um, that term premium has been uh, rising. That's partly a function, as you say, higher for longer, but also I think um, concern about issuance uh, trends, you know, massive uh, uh, government deficit in the, in the States, uh, which is surprising at a time when the economy is pretty strong, uh, and also less demand for, from, uh, for bonds from central banks now doing quantitative tightening rather than quantitative easing, which obviously a reversal uh, of the trends we had since the financial crisis. So, yes, I mean, the, the further those yields go up, the Potentially, the more impact there is on the um, economy, not least uh, corporate borrowing costs, but also uh, mortgage rates. I mean, mortgage rates in the States now are well over 7.5% um, and could be going higher shortly. So, uh, yeah, I mean, the longer that goes on, and also potentially if the Fed has to raise rates again, um, you know, you would start to worry that we may end up seeing a hard landing scenario next year. But that's not where we are at the moment. But, um, you know, clearly that's being talked about at the moment. Certainly, and it's something we must certainly remain vigilant of. Uh, moving from the US, we must also acknowledge uh, the unfolding developments in the Levant. Our thoughts are very much with those affected. Now, Richard, whilst acknowledging the devastating consequences for those in the area, uh, could you perhaps touch upon the wider market implications for what's been going on? Yes, yeah, so this obviously came as a big shock over the weekend, what's been going on uh, in Israel uh, and, and Gaza. Um, I mean, Unfortunately, um, it's part of the sort of cycle of violence that we've seen in the area for for a long time. So I suppose in that sense, um, market the markets might be sort of 
you know, less shot than they otherwise would be, you know, compared to a sort of, you know, the whole Russian invasion of Ukraine scenario, for example. Um, I think the wider implications for markets as things stand, if it's just a sort of um, uh, part of the ongoing, you know, cycle of violence between Israel and Palestine and Palestinians might not be too severe for markets other than kind of what we've seen, a brief, you know, a bit of a pickup in the oil price, bit of a rally and. Uh, sovereign bond yields. I mean, the, the danger, of course, and you know, the, the attacks were, you know, extreme. You, know, you could argue, sort of, on a par with nine eleven or something. Um, you know, if other countries in the region were to become involved, whether Israel would decide to lash out at Iran, whether the Americans get involved, that's when markets probably would be more concerned about the um, long term implications. But if it's just a, you know, probably a sort of your Israeli military incursion into Gaza, you would think that um, markets will probably, you know, cynical as it sounds, sort of go back to worrying about interest rates and all the rest of it. But uh, we'll obviously be watching the, the region closely. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting you can bring it back full, uh, full circle to uh, interest rate expectations. I mean, I know this morning that the Fed funds futures hasn't really moved off the back of this. Does that to your minds, imply that the oil squeeze this morning is up uh, between 3 and 5% is expected to be temporary? Or does this perhaps speak to other factors like uh, the US's energy independence? Yes, partly. I mean, I think um, we should also put in the context of, you know, there's been a lot of talk about oil recently. Um, you know, it's, the price went up to 100, close to 100, and then it came all the way back down Um in pretty short order. So actually, I think it was down you know, 10% plus last week. So a little bounce, um, you know, at the start of the week today is is not uh, probably in terms of inf- impact on inflation and rates is not that severe. I think, um, you know, there's been a lot of talk about potential demand for oil slowing if um, the global economy goes into recession or, or, or you, know, grow, you know, has a growth slowdown. So from that perspective, as I say, the, the Israel conflict, as long as it doesn't spread, is probably going to be of limited impact. Thank you, Richard. Very comprehensive, as always. Um, Now, it's also been a very challenging year for challenger banks. In March this year, we saw the failure of three US regional banks. Though not necessarily a challenger, listeners will not have missed the apocal collapse of Credit Suisse. Now, here in the UK, High Street newcomer Metro Bank ended last week on an uncertain footing. Will, could you please set the scene for us? Uh, firstly, who are Metro Bank and how does their business model differ to that of other well-known incumbents? Uh, yeah, Metro Bank launched in 2010 with great fanfare as it was the first new high street bank in over 100 years to be granted a license. In terms of how they differentiated themselves, it was really about their service levels relative to the incumbent banks. Um, so really promoted through their branch network, which were largely in busy high street locations. I'm sure we've all seen the metro branches um, and they were really used as a form of marketing uh, versus the incumbents and to really drive deposit growth as well. The founder who was a US businessman or is a US businessman by the name of Vernon Hill had enjoyed success with a bank called Commerce Bank in in New Jersey in the US and and Metro was really introduced to try and recreate some of that success in the UK. Marvellous, thank you. Yes, we none of us will have missed uh, the Metro Bank mascot who would normally get in your way as you try to go about your shopping. Um, could you just speak to how Metro Bank got into its current predicament and maybe draw on any similarities in the factors that contributed to the US regional banking crisis? Yeah, the bank has been struggling for profitability really since launch. Um, So largely through that time, we've had base rates near enough at zero. Uh, Obviously, that's changed more recently, but that's the base rates at zero really weighed on their deposit led model. And I think also, perhaps more importantly, you know, their branch first strategy is expensive. And it's also going against the grain of the incumbent banks. So most of the big high street banks are reducing their branch networks. So really reflecting you know, consumer preferences to do more banking online uh, rather than in the branches. And Metro have never really reached the scale to cover you know, that expensive branch network. They've had some other issues, of course. They fell out with the regulator in 2019 when they effectively misstated their capital position by 
publishing some incorrect figures on risk-weighted assets relating to their commercial property and buy-to-let um, loan books as well. Last month, they had another setback when they didn't get approval for their mortgage book uh, with um, to use lower risk weightings effectively and um, you know improve their capital position and boost profitability. So I think they're sort of in idiosyncratic issues really relative to what happened with Silicon Valley. I mean, that was a bank that was very concentrated in the tech sector in the US and then loaded up, loaded up on duration risk um, through mortgage-backed securities, for example, and those fell in value very sharply as as, move, as rates moved um, you know, higher very quickly. So I, I don't see too many parallels, but obviously it's, it is a tougher environment, I think, uh, you know, if you're a, a riskier bank at the moment. So, um, yeah, worth highlighting. Thank you. And over the weekend, um, a refinancing package was agreed uh, between its major shareholders and bondholders that would effectively shore up the balance sheet. Uh, what would, had that not come to pass, what would have the systemic risk of a Metro Bank failure had been, would have been to the UK banking sector in general? Yeah, so it seems we've got another lifeline, so another refinancing package, as you've mentioned, uh, backed by their largest shareholder, a, a Colombian billionaire, also some debt refinancing in there as well. Uh, looks like some haircuts for the tier two bonds as well, for example, taking sort of 40 percent odd haircuts on, on some of those tier two bonds. They're also looking to sell off some of their residential mortgage book as well um, to improve their capital position. So you've got a few things going on in order to shore up the balance sheet. Um, I struggle to see that it's sort of systemic, um, you know, if, if, if they hadn't uh, got this lifeline. Just remember, it is relatively small in the scheme of things. So Metro Bank, even with a loan book of sort of 12 and a half billion, you know, you're just a fraction of the size of some of the, the largest incumbent banks. So, you know, compared with Lloyd's at sort of uh, 450 billion. So Metro really a fraction of the size of the big incumbent banks. Um, but yeah, nevertheless, obviously creating some headlines at the moment, but good to see a refinancing package has been agreed on in the near term. That was really useful, Will, thank you. Just zooming out again, uh, this week heralds the start of the Q3 reporting season. Among the first on the docket, on the earnings docket, always the banks. Uh, Will, what can investors expect from this Q3 reporting season? Um, what should we be focusing on? Yeah, the US banks kicking off with uh, JP Morgan, who always seem to clear a high bar. So they're reporting on Friday this week. I think, you know, there will be the, the normal nerdy focus on things like net interest margins. I think some signs of green shoots for investment banking, or certainly that's the message that is being portrayed by the big banks perhaps as we near the end of the, the rate hiking cycle, you know, there's a bit more, um, you know, the, the bid ask spread between buyers and sellers just reduces a bit if there's more confidence that we've reached the end of that rate hiking cycle. So, you know, to debate whether that is the case, but certainly that's the message that the, the US banks are talking about. There's going to be discussion on capital. So the US is tightening some regulation here. So we need to understand the implications. I think asset quality will be fine because unemployment is remaining low. As uh, Richard has mentioned, you know, that recession is, seems to be being pushed back ever more. So, you know, I think asset quality will be holding up. I think what will be particularly in focus this quarter is the losses on the bonds on banks' balance sheets as rates have moved higher. And you've seen, you know, 10-year um, yields have moved, you know, ever higher since the, the first half results. So um, some banks are looking worse than, than others on that. JP Morgan actually handled this um, much better than some of the other large banks. So it's much, much smaller losses on those um, those bonds and than, than some of the others. So Bank of America, for example, looking a little worse on that. Um, so I think that will be in focus as well, um, losses on, on bonds. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll learn more on Friday. That's marvellous. Thank you. And um, do you reckon with these uh, losses that they may have to report on their current bond holdings that they're going to be less likely to participate in other financing activities like sort of the LBO sector in private markets? Um. Yeah, there's, there's, 
I think that they were still working through some of the, the losses that have been taken there. I think that's that's a fair comment. And what you have seen is some of the alternative managers being able to exploit that opportunity um, by providing financing where some of the banks have, have pulled back. Um, I think that's, that's a good observation. Um, yeah, I think, again, it sort of depends on the bank. Some some banks are, are very profitable. Let's look at someone like JP Morgan, where they have that 17% return on tangible equity target. So they build capital very quickly. So they're able to withstand or uh, adapt to different capital regimes very quickly. Um, so I think it's, it's a case by case with them, as it ever is with them, um, with some of the banks. Thank you, Will. Um, and indeed, thank you both for those great insights. And to you all for listening. Did you enjoy our discussion today? We'd love to hear from our listeners. So please do review the show now, wherever you're listening. Share it on your socials and tag us at Quilt Achievers. To make sure you don't miss a future episode, please tap the subscribe button. We'll be back next Tuesday. But in the meantime, please head over to our website on www.quiltachieviot.com where you can read the accompanying market overview as well as subscribe to the weekly comment newsletter. You can also stay up to date on our thoughts on markets, industry insights and upcoming events and webinars on our website and our social media pages. Finally, do you have a question you'd like to ask one of our experts for our next podcast? Simply ask them via the weekly comments page on our website. We would love to hear from you. And that's it for today. So thank you once again to Richard and to Will for your time and to you all for listening. We'll see you next time.